So we're talking very, about very whether good. it's so, so I, I was Right. And, and so the question then is, you know, what's beyond the interface, right? If we're going to talk about free will and, and so forth, what's, what, what is our theory about what's, what's beyond the interface? And, and as I mentioned before we got cut off, you know, I don't know. No one knows. Um, even the physicists who are looking for structures beyond space-time, they're finding things that they call like an amplitohedron, a sociohedron, cosmological polytopes, but they have no notion of process, and they don't know what these structures are about. All they know is that they are, they're finding these structures and they let them predict scattering events at the Large Hadron Collider, but there's no understanding about what this new realm is really about. So, so what I'm working on with my colleagues is a theory of consciousness, that reality is a vast interacting network of conscious agents, like uh, a, a social network, like, like the Twitterverse. And so we have a mathematical model of consciousness, of conscious agents, and in that model, I'll just say, individual agents um, have conscious experiences and make free will choices based on those experiences. So I, I am assuming some notion of free will, and if, if, if you're interested, we can go into it a little bit, but it's, it's a, a distributive notion of free will. It's a very interesting top-down and bottom-up flowing of, of influences in, in this notion of free will. But in that model, um, there is free will, and you only see the agents and their actions through an interface. So w when I see my body, and I see my hand picking up something, I, I'm not, I, I don't actually see myself except through an interface. My body is just a icon. It's just a virtual reality symbol. I don't know what I'm really doing in objective reality. All I know is what I see my hand doing. What I'm actually doing in objective reality, I have no idea. And and so it's it's a very very interesting point of view. We know a lot less than 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 we thought, and yet we're also in some sense more directly acquainted with reality than we thought. Because if reality is a bunch of conscious agents, and I'm a conscious agent then I'm not divorced from reality, I am part of that reality. So this is a very interesting situation in which I'm actually connected with reality, but what I perceive is um, just an icon. I don't actually perceive myself as I am. So I, I'll stop there. Yeah, so Usman, can you um, make your comment or question, please? Um, hello, sir. Uh, my uh, quest question was, uh, uh, in, in practical everyday life, uh, where all the laws and forensics are depending on the free will concept, how yes. your insight, how your insight is going to influence in the coming future, the current concept, how is it going to change? Right. So I would say most of my colleagues, my physicalist colleagues, would say, like, like Sam Harris, for example, <clears throat> would say that free will is, of course, an illusion. <clears throat> and, and so, even though it's a central concept in, in law, <clears throat> right, we look for motive. Um, you know, if, between first degree murder and manslaughter, it has to do with motive, and that has to do with, you know, free wills and, and choices and so forth. <clears throat> Strictly speaking, um, the determinists would say that there's no such thing as, as that, that kind of free will. The, the kind of theory that I'm talking about, in which coming out of the mathematics, is not an absolute free will. Rather, it's that there's a whole bunch of agents, like a whole like Twitterverse, like it's a vast network of conscious agents. When two agents interact, they create a new agent. Each agent at its own level has its contribution of free will. But it's influenced by the free will contributions of all the agents that comprise it, and it comp it also influences the free will agents above it that that it's a part of, and so there's going to be top down and bottom up influences. That's why it looks like brain activity from our within our interface. That's why it looks like the brain activity is preceding our choices. It's that's our interface version of this whole network of conscious agents that we're involved in, free choice information flowing up and flowing down. So the, the point of view that I'm working on would seem to lead to 
a theory of free will in which you don't have absolute free will, which makes sense, right? I mean, I if, if I am someone who has incredible anxieties, my range of choices are going to be different from the range of choices that someone who is perfectly calm will have. So, so, so it makes sense. So I, I think that ultimately, first, right now, there is no mathematical model of free will. There is none. So we're, we're hoping to propose the first mathematically precise model of free will where we actually show top-down and bottom-up influences. We should be able to simulate free will and actually begin to understand it. We'll also be the first to, to not dismiss free will <laughs> in terms of a precise scientific theory. All the precise scientific theories in neuroscience um, dismiss free will. And in pretty much all the free people who buy free will don't have any mathematical models to, to, to back it up. So what we need is a mathematical model of free will that can then be tested empirically. And that's what we're hoping to get. Thank you. Oh, that sounds fascinating. Um, Talha raised his hand. Uh, Talha, do you, do you have your question? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for your talk. It's very interesting. I have a question uh, regarding the free will. Uh, we humans have a ability to do the critical thinking as compared to the animals which probably don't have this capability. So what's the difference in the free will or whatever you want to say between the animals and the human, the thinking process? How do you compare that to the free will, this difference of critical thinking being present in the humans? Yeah, that, that's a, a great question. So we, what's, what's interesting about our species is that we build elaborate mental models, right? That's, we have the huge frontal lobes and we, we build elaborate mental models and we simulate what might happen. Uh, and that's a way of avoiding actually having to sacrifice our bodies. We, we sacrifice them virtually in our, our mental simulations. And so in many cases, when we're, we're thinking about our choices and, and the, the actions that are you know, available to us. From a neuroscience point of view, what we're doing is, is you know, we have these uh, neural models that we're, that we're building and we're running through the simulations and then making choices based on what, what outcomes we, we see in those models. The, the difference between us and, and other animals in that respect would be, I think, not absolute, but a matter of degree. I, you, you can see, for example, in macaque monkeys and so forth, that they also have mental models that, and they they learn from experience, and and they're simulating in their heads. So, so I I think that from an evolutionary point of view. So I'm just now speaking, at, you know, evolutionary biology and and so forth in that framework. I, I would say that there's not a, a a division of you know a a fundamental division between humans and other animals. It's a graded kind of, of thing. And so there wouldn't be a, 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 a gap between humans and other animals in terms of free will choices in, in that regard. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. So uh, Joshua has raised his hand again. Joshua, do you have any uh, comments? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, ma'am. I had a question. Uh, so the way uh, Professor Hoffman uh, explained free will, it seemed as if, and I want to be corrected if I'm mistaking and misinterpreting what he's saying, it seems that free will is almost a model of an accumulation of uh, mass probabilities where each individual actor, uh, since the, each individual act, actor can do multiple things and therefore a bigger individual actor will do can have a greater probability of doing multiple things and therefore free will almost seems like just the accumulation of a lot of multiple probabilities of each of these individual actors am i articulating it sort of yeah well, that's that's a, right that's a big part of it um it's not the only aspect of it there's it's but but you're absolutely right so probabilities are really critical and what happens when you go to the higher levels is is really quite interesting it, it, the, the dynamics that we're talking about is a Markovian dynamics. And what happens when agents interact to create a new level is the asymptotic behavior. So it's a bunch of free will choices at one level and an asymptotic sequence of them that leads to a single step at the higher level. So that, that's almost like a different time frame. And so, so the, 
so you have every time you move up a level in this in this network of interacting conscious agents, the higher levels are at a different time frame, where it's essentially a huge number of steps at one level is a single step at the higher level. And so when an agent at the higher level then makes a choice, that's sort of like giving a big um, boundary condition on all the all the choices at the lower level. It's changing the boundary conditions on the asymptotic dynamics. So you can see this is going to be complicated mathematically. The, the mathematics of this is really complicated. But but and the other aspect of this is just the, the probabilities themselves. Right? When you talk about probability, um, there's two ways that that you can think about probabilities. My 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 friends like Sam Harris would say that probabilities are really just statements of objective chance. Not free will, objective chance. This is just unconscious nature um, doing, you know, throwing up random stuff. The other way of interpreting probability, and, and by the way, if, if we live in a physicalist universe where consciousness is fundamental, then yeah, I would, I would say that Sam is right, right? That in that universe, when you see probabilities, there's nothing about free will there. That's just objective chance. But in this other framework in which space and time are not fundamental, in which mm -hmm. consciousness is fundamental, now the probabilities, if I, if I interpreted the probabilities as object, objective chance, I would be a dualist. Right? Because what I'm saying consciousness is fundamental, but now I'm bringing in something that's unconscious that also has a fundamental by objective chance, I bring in something unconscious that has a fundamental activity as well. So I would be a dualist, and I don't want to do that. So, so that's why I now interpret the probabilities as free will, describing free will choices as opposed to objective chance. So, but your what your point was absolutely right. It's just that you, as you can see, the mathematics is much more complicated as well. So, so since I'm not a mathematician, the way I understood what you said was it, since each step. Uh, in the act, in in each setup in, in the level makes a huge difference to what is happening. It's almost as if uh, how an, a two-dimensional uh, character interacts with the three-dimensional character is the easiest way I could comprehend it. That's that that's a a good metaphor. It um you know it it has its limitations, but it, that's a good metaphor just to let you think about a completely new level that 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 emerges. The other, the other metaphor is that, you know, what is an entire sequence of behaviors at one level is a single step at the higher level. So a whole sequence of, so a whole sequence of maybe a billion free choices at one level now corresponds to a single step at, at a higher level. And what's happening is the, the single free choice at the higher level then is experienced as an influence on the billions of choices at the lower level. It's sort of like, an, uh, uh, like for example, I, I can jump, but because I'm in gravity, I can only jump so high. I can't jump 10 feet. I can only jump two or three feet high. That is the, so there's a boundary condition on my free will. Yes, I'm free to jump, but I'm not free to jump to the moon. And so, so there are these limitations on, on the exercises of my free will that I experience as boundary conditions, like the boundary condition of a gravitational field is limiting my free choices. And so that's what these other, other levels of conscious agents are, how their free choices are, are limiting my free choices. And yet I do have the free choice to jump two feet, but not 20 feet. <laughs> Does that make sense? Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yes. So Sarah, Sarah has raised her hand, Sarah. Sorry. Once again, a very simplistic question relating to practical um, uh, to the practical world. When we talk about some Wall Street traders, you know, making brilliant predictions regarding the future or deja vu. So, would it be uh, access to information, or would it be absolute chance, or would it be just nurture? Because I do remember reading this article in the New York Times years ago about how some people have this uncanny capacity to predict the future. And that is a sign of a heightened level of intelligence. So I would love to hear your views on that. Right, so great question. And, and I think the way I, I would answer it is in terms of which framework we assume. So, so in the standard physicalist, determinist, reductionist framework, 
Um, there, there is no such thing as ESP. <laughs> There's no such thing as um, super senses or anything like that. So the traders who are really quite good are good simply because they um, have intelligently gathered the right information and made the right probabilistic inferences and maybe got a little bit of luck as well. Um, so, so that would be you know, within a physicalist framework. Now, in this framework in which consciousness is fundamental, uh, it's not clear to me yet. That clear, well, what is clear is that there will be all, forms, all sorts of forms of conscious experiences and knowledge that go well beyond what we're used to. Absolutely clear. I mean, a theory in which conscious agents are fundamental is not limited to human forms of consciousness. It, it's embracing an un unbounded variety of consciousnesses whose experiences are utterly, many of them utterly alien to anything that we could even imagine, much less have ever experienced. And time isn't fundamental. So, so one, once again, time is merely a format of a of our visualization tool of, of our virtual reality is not a fundamental nevertheless space and time and the laws of physics are the way that our particular form of consciousness interacts with all these other consciousnesses so although in principle this framework of conscious agents allows for unbounded variety of experiences and time isn't fundamental and so in principle there could be these you know remarkable um, extrasensory uh, supersensory kinds of things that go on um, that's certainly in principle possible we're gonna have, we'll have to understand what those are how they how this dynamics of conscious agents maps into space and time in, into our virtual reality headset right so, so the way I think about it is, is this. Think about the Twitterverse. There's millions of Twitter users, billions of tweets. No one could completely understand that. You can't see all the tweets. You can't interact with all the Twitter users. It's, it's overwhelming. So what do we do when we have overwhelming social data? What we do is we have a, a, a visualization tool. Right? We like to have some simple eye candy to see what's, what's um, you know, trending in Pakistan versus what's trending in the United States or what's happening in New York versus what's happening in Delhi or, or something like that, right? So we wanted a visualization tool that takes all the millions of users, the billions of tweets, compresses it into simple colored objects doing simple things that we can understand. Oh, that's what's trending in Delhi. Oh, that's what's happening in Los Angeles. We, we just see it from these colored objects. So, so that we want a visualization tool like that. So there's this compression of the vast network of conscious agents into space and time. We need to get that mapping. How is our visualization tool constructed? Once we understand, and that's what I'm working on right now, that, that's my, my full-time effort, is trying to get a mathematical model of mapping the dynamics of conscious agents into space and time. Once we do that, then we can try to answer your, your question in a very, very precise way and ask, to what extent can we really fool with space and time? What can we circumvent space and time, do things that look anomalous, that, that look, may look like it's coming from the future or, or have some kind of form of extrasensory perception? It's very much like um, like 200 years ago when, you know, almost 200 years ago when Maxwell was working, well, not Maxwell, but Faraday was working on, you know, magnets and wires and iron filings. And if someone back then had said, you know what, um, with what you're doing, people will be able, uh, someone in California We'll be able to talk with someone in Pakistan, and they'll hear immediately, instantly, and they'll be able to see each other instantly. They'll go, "That's a miracle." I mean, it would be uh, uh, unbelievable. And then I say, "Well, but wait, but, you know, we have to go from iron filings and magnets and frog legs that are twitching. It's going to take us about 200 years of hard, hard work. But once we understand it, then we'll reverse engineer this whole thing. We'll have Maxwell's equations." And then all the technology, and in about 200 years, then we can do that. And that's that's what I'm saying is that we'll have to understand the network of conscious agents, how it maps into space and time, and then I think that we will get technologies that will seem to us today like magic. Um, we'll probably be able to bend space and time, for example.
literally just, reshape them. Thank you so much. I just have to make this comment that brings me to this big Sufi poet, saint, philosopher of the Eastern world that says, Sataron se aage jahan aur bhi hai. Roughly translated, it means that they are millions and billions of universe beyond the universe, the stars beyond this universe we know. So the human intellect is unfolding. And sorry to use up the conversation, but very quickly, all your talk about this mapping, what's your take on AI, artificial intelligence? Right. Uh, the new face of uh, choices and free will and determinism. So where do you see uh, the human intellect um, in this new AI universe? I, sorry, Tanya, I hope I'm not usurping, oh, no, but so. this it's is a, so it's brilliant. It's a great question. I let Don answer that. Yes, yeah, that's a great question. In fact, that, that question is, in some sense, what got me into this whole field back when I was a teenager. I decided I needed to understand what could AIs do um, and what, is there anything special about humans. And so, so from the, uh, again, within the framework of physicalism and determinism and reductionism, in that framework, the way my, my friends um, think about artificial intelligence is as follows. They, they would say, that of course a machine can be conscious. Brains are machines and brains are conscious. So there's nothing special about a carbon-based machine. Why, sh why shouldn't a, a silicon-based machine be conscious? And so once we understand how a complex machine with the right kind of dynamical complexity gives rise to consciousness like the brain, then absolutely we'll be able to make AIs that are conscious. So that's, that's one point of view. Now, as, as a re result, of course, um, of what I've talked about earlier, space-time is not fundamental and, and reductionism is false. So I think that, that that whole framework for understanding AI and consciousness is, is deeply flawed. So what about from the framework that I'm talking about now, which space-time is just a virtual, virtual reality. It's a visualization tool. And the reality is this vast network of, of interacting conscious agents. Well, there it's interesting. What we do know is that our interface does give us portals into the realm of conscious agents, right? The portal uh, that I have right now, for example, I, I, on my screen, I, I see uh, Tanya's face, right? Well, the face that I'm seeing, of course, is just my symbol. It's, uh, it's in my visual system. It's, uh, it's my construction. But it's nevertheless my portal into Tanya's consciousness. I can tell, you know, if she were crying, I could tell that, and I would, you know, know that she's sad. If she's smiling, I would. So, so I have, uh, you know, fallible but genuine access to aspects of Tanya's consciousness through this portal in my interface. With, when I look at my cat, uh, I have a portal into uh, the consciousness of my cat, but it's not nearly as good as the portal into a human. Um, I can tell if my cat likes the food I'm giving it, if it likes, wants to be pet and so forth. When I see an ant, my portal is getting very, very dim. And when I see an amoeba, I'm, I've given up, right? No surprise, that's the whole point of a interface and a visualization tool. You're, you're data compressing, you're dumbing things down, and you're trying to ignore most of the reality. So of course things are gonna look stupid because you're dumbing things down. So, so, so from this point of view, my interface does give me portals into consciousness. And the question is, if I understand the interface well enough, can I reverse engineer my interface to open up new portals into this pre-existing realm of conscious agents? And for what it's worth, I think the answer is yes. And the technology that we end up hitting on to do this may look like artificial intelligence technology, but it would be interpreted in a very different way. It's not that circuits and software and silicon are somehow you know, we start with unconscious matter and we get consciousness emerging from it. It's different. Consciousness is already out there. We're reverse engineering our space-time interface and opening a new hole, a new portal into the realm of conscious agents. We do have one technology. 
right now for opening new portals into this, right? That's how we get new portals into the realm of conscious agents. But, but once we can reverse engineer our interface, we might be able to open up new portals. So in that sense, I think, yes, there will be AIs that are conscious. Uh, wow. <laughs> Thank you. I have a zillion questions, but for the sake of, of being polite, I'll just shut up. Thank you so much. <laughs> no, 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 I will take a question, but right now we have a question from Dr. Madiha's husband. Would you introduce yourself, Dr. Madiha's husband? Oh, sure. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Abayas Karalev. Nothing to do with this subject, but I'm, uh, I'm an avid reader of uh, many of the things and topics that Dr. has been speaking about. So a couple of comments and then uh, one or two questions. One, um, I think, Doctor, you were trying to explain the Libet experiments, right? And how yes, it for example, to be explained. I think there was one explanation that uh, you missed out on, which I find particularly intriguing. It's Roger Penrose's, you know, where he actually has worked with another neurologist to come up with this quantum bules theory that there is a quantum computer inside, and you know, time is an emerging phenomenon. Aves, we can't hear you. You're on mute. We can't hear you. Uh, Aves, you're on. Uh... Sorry. So one on libid experiments, I think it's interesting to highlight uh, Roger Penrose's theory as well. That is very interesting. Um, but I'm totally with you. Lib libid experiment doesn't negate free will. There are many ways to interpret that. Number two, I think on consciousness, I'm very intrigued by David Chalmers' theories on qualia and you know that it is fundamental, it is universal out of which many things derive. I think you're taking it to one higher level, but uh, I, I'm with you on that. And I'm not a fan of Sam Harris, just being very blunt. I know he might be your friend, but I am a fan of Annika. I think she wrote a wonderful book. And yeah. Anybody and everybody should read that book. Um, um, third, I, this is where I was going to go. So I, I'm actually fairly aligned with your views fairly aligned and I've done extensive reading on these topics and uh, I've read Danette and everyone that you've spoken of so far. One, this whole theory that consciousness is universal and the fundamental element of objective reality also helps me explain the power of prayer and paranormal activity. And ultimately, I think science will get there where we will be able to monitor and measure and construct experiments which will be able to prove this out, right? I'm not necessarily preaching religion here, but the power that your brain has that you know consciousness could, could be residing outside your brain, that, that's what I believe, it's not inside the brain. It's not emergent, just like Danette would make you believe it, right? But have, are you doing any experiments, any concrete experiments to prove this out? Because ultimately the scientists, right, who largely deny free will, and at the same time, almost 100% agree with the non-deterministic nature of quantum mechanics, right? Relatively, relatively fails in black holes, as you said. Um, but, but, but they don't reconcile the two things. They will only listen to you if you can construct an actual experiment, like a scientist, and prove that the results meet your theory, right? So are you actually working on a specific experiment to prove these things out? Right. So you, you raised, are you three, at the theories? Right. So you raised three three good points. So on um, Stuart Hameroff and, and and Roger Penrose, I'm I'm good friends with with Stuart on the microtubules theory. Um, yeah. He and I have known each other for years, and uh, and he knows that when I get on the stage with him, uh, I'm going to ask him this question. I'm going to say, "Great. So qualia are due to the orchestrated collapse of microtubule states." So Stuart, and this is what I literally said to him just a couple years ago on stage with four or 500 people in the audience. I said, Stuart, so great, give me one. Um, you know, like the taste of vanilla or the smell of a rose. Can you give me any one specific conscious experience where you can tell me what is the orchestrated collapse of microtubules that, that, that gives rise to that? And he hemmed and hawed and I pushed and pushed and pushed and he finally said no. And he knows the next time I'm gonna get up there with him, I'm gonna say exactly the same thing. It's, it's an abstract idea that cannot explain even one specific conscious experience, and it never will. It, it, it never will. Um, it's, it's a reductionist theory, and it, and it won't work. Uh, now, Chalmers is also a friend of mine, um, and uh, he's one of the most brilliant um, thinkers in, in this field. I love his writing because it's not 
Um, he's not trying to pitch anything. He's just trying to understand the issues. He's, he's brilliant. Um, so he's talked a, a lot about pan, panpsychism. So does Annika. There's, and I'll just, my, my view on panpsychism, um, there's a lot of different theories that go under the label panpsychism. The, the, the main one that I think is, is the, the guiding one is the idea that the laws of physics are fundamental, but physics doesn't tell you what it's about. You know, what, what, what is inside an electron? What is, what is inside a proton? You know, in some sense, an electron in physics is just a series of equations, the field equations for the behavior of an electron. But what, what yeah, as, as Hawking put it, what, what, what brings fire into the equations, right? And so panpsychism says, well, it's consciousness. That's what's breathing fire into the equations. There's a consciousness inside the electron and proton and so forth. Um, I think that that's too limited. The theory of conscious agents that I'm developing allows conscious agents to interact in any way that you can imagine, not just according to the laws of physics. The laws of physics are merely one trivial visualization tool that one kind of conscious agent uses. I'm imagining that there are countless other visualization tools outside of, beyond space and time. So I think panpsychism, it, it, it fails because it's just too limited a vision of what consciousness, the freedom that consciousness has, the varieties of conscious experience. Now on the paranormal, I'm also good friends with, with many people who have, are working on, on you know, Dean Radin and others, uh, Rupert Sheldrake, they're, they're friends of mine, and, and uh, you know, they're nice people, I like them, but here, here's the problem. It's actually, I think, the, the, the problem is in the other direction. Rupert and Dean and these people um, have, and Daryl Bem, for example, with his precognition studies and so forth, they have data that they claim is showing, you know, you know paranormal phenomena. But like in the case of Daryl Bem, he shows, he claims in, to show that there's a 400 millisecond precognition effect in, in, in his experiments. As a scientist, my attitude is, okay, well, so what is your theory that predicts that the precognition effect should be at 400 milliseconds and not 4,000 milliseconds or 4 milliseconds? What is your theory? There isn't one. There is no, nobody in the paranormal realm has a precise mathematical theory that says this is exactly the time frame for this effect and here's exactly how it works and ha here's how it interacts with the standard models in space and time. And believe me, there is absolutely no way that any self-respecting scientist is going to listen to them until there's a scientific theory that makes that kind of prediction. We don't care. Mm -hmm. right? We frankly don't care that you have experiments that seem to contradict our current science if you don't have a theory. We don't give a rip. Until there's a scientific theory, there's nothing for us to pay attention to. You probably have some kind of mistake in your experiment. There's probably some, you know, wh whatever. We don't care. But if you, if, if Bem came back and said, you know what? I actually have a theory that predicts 400 milliseconds. And if it was 200 milliseconds, my theory would be wrong. Wow. Okay. Now you've got our attention. So that's what the, the paranormal researchers need. They don't need more experiments. They need a theory. And, and I tell this to them. These are my friends. And I tell them, you know, just as a friend, I say, look, you want to influence the field? This is not the way to do it. There's only one way to influence the field. Give me a mathematically precise theory of the paranormal realm. Now, what I'm doing with this theory of conscious agents is trying to get the framework for which eventually we can get a mathematically precise account of exactly these effects and make new predictions. But, but it will be taken seriously if we can actually get the mapping from conscious agents into space time. What I'm doing right now, I'm spending all of my time learning the physics of scattering amplitudes. At the Large Hadron Collider, for example, I, mm -hmm. I want to start with a theory of conscious agents and predict two gluon in, five gluon out scattering to 10 decimal places. Then and only then should any scientist start to take my theory seriously. Until I can do that, they shouldn't take, they, they shouldn't take me seriously. And, and so, so that's what we need to do. Then, of course, the predictions I, I bet that we will make 
will make the, the kinds of things that the paranormal studies, they'll be trivial. I'll be talking about changing space-time, warping space-time, allowing faster than light travel. It's going to be a completely different game. But once we understand how the interface works, we'll be able to play the interface, just like a software engineer can yeah. play with Grand Theft Auto and, and you know take gasoline out of the tank or change the road conditions or, or, or give a flat tire. We'll be able to play with space-time. So I think the the kinds of things that are being done in the paranormal, they're, they're not thinking big enough about the paranormal phenomena. I think that they're going to be far bigger. We'll be able to change space-time itself. And they're not thinking precise enough. They need a mathematical model. So we need to do what Maxwell did, right? Yeah. Well, beyond iron filings that, and magnets. That's, that's, that's exactly what I was saying. You know, until you, you're able to get to a prediction that can then be tested and proven, that's the point scientists would believe you. Uh, right. My last question, and then I'll move on. This sequence of agents, right, conscious agents, is there an ultimate consciousness in that model that everything is drawing consciousness from? The nice thing is that that's going to be a theorem of the theory. The answer to that question, I don't know the answer to the question. And it, it will depend on whether we, um, for example, are using the real numbers or if we're going to only use like um, countable sets of, of numbers, that's going to be one, one is, issue. Um, but, but one way it might come out is that there is, maybe there is not, so well, when agents interact, they create new agents. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the point. So now is there a single maximal agent at any one point in the evolution of this, uh, the system? That will be, you know, now some mathematical structures will have a single greatest element, a, a lattice with a single maximum point. So others will have multiple maxima and no single global maximum. So, so I don't know what, what is going to come out. Okay. Um, uh, that's going to be very, very interesting. And also, I don't know if it's going to be literally infinite or not. Right? There's the, a real question about the reality there, by the way, there's a paper by a guy named uh, physicist G-I-S-I-N, Giesen, which I highly recommend. If you look up Giesen, last couple of years he's been talking about, are the real numbers real? And, are, you know, and he calls them just random numbers. Real numbers aren't really real numbers, they're random numbers. And, and so there's this real issue about um, when we're talking about infinite consciousnesses, are we talking, when we talk about infinity anything, does that make, are we really making sense or not? And mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that, but so I'll be working on mathematical models um, in which it may turn out that there's a single infinite conscious agent, in which case that might correspond to what some spiritual traditions would, would think of as Brahman or God or, or, or whatever, the higher power. There may be multiple, in which case it might be a polytheistic kind of approach. They, it may end up being unbounded but finite which would be very very interesting that would be a, a that, that would be a model in which consciousness itself what we might put god in quotes is always growing always exploring and never arriving that would be that kind of model of consciousness which i find attractive but of course just because i find it attractive doesn't mean i have to i need to actually go wherever the logic and that's what i want is a mathematically precise thing we, we've talked about this kind of thing for thousands of years, but no one's ever written down math. And it's yeah. not until we write down math that we can actually prove theorems and, and be surprised. Yes, I can. I, I let, I, I'll just let everybody in, and I just want to give you a proper um, thank you and uh, ask for your views of how you found this discussion and this group. Is this your first time interacting in Pakistan, or have you... Um... Yes, it's my first time interacting in Pakistan, and, and uh, I... Uh, I very much enjoyed the, 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 the great questions and, and also the spirit of, of the whole exchange. I very much appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's, it's such an honor for us because this is like a small group of friends getting together and talking about interesting stuff. And to have you here is uh, so exciting and uh, such an honor for me. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation. So much. Thank you so much for joining us. In, uh, we'll plan something new again. And hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll talk again. Okay. Love is. Goodbye. It was a great pleasure. Okay.
Thank you.